Var det tuffligt? Ja. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are a couple of minutes late, so let's just start quickly and uh, not be noisy. Uh, so the, we start the morning session uh, with uh, Misha Lukin from Harvard, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, Rydberg AI. So, Misha, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, I'd like to start out by thanking the organizers for invitation to this uh, wonderful meetings, a uh, weekly meeting, and actually I enjoyed the day yesterday, so I can uh, modified my talk a little bit uh, in response to what was discussed yesterday. So uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, um, our efforts in a field which can be viewed as a quest for controlling quantum uh, world. And uh, uh, in this um, effort, what we are doing is we are basically isolating and controlling some simple quantum objects and then we are trying to build more and complex uh, more and more complex systems from them. And what we we'll to do with these systems is to study new physics with these engineered many body systems, for example, create and probe a new states of matter, and then uh, relate to a topic of this conference, we'd like to also explore some um, protocols and applications in quantum information processing. So despite uh, of all of this intention and excitement in the field, uh, I'd like to start out by pointing out uh, two kind of things which are probably obvious uh, to this community is that at this point we still do not know do not know how to build truly large-scale quantum machines and this is very much related to the comment that uh, John has made yesterday let's try to use small-scale machines to build large-scale machines but there is also another problem uh, in the field and this uh, is a problem of even if we build the machines today we would know what to do with them and I think I would like to add to or encourage you know, John to add to his list that maybe, I hope, we can use small scale quantum computers to really learn what quantum machines can actually do. So uh, motivated by some of these considerations, what uh, I'd like to do is introduce kind of a, a class of platforms, which uh, I think also will be continued in Pinter Zoller's talk later today. Uh, which we call programmable quantum simulator. So this is basically kind of a new approach uh, to build uh, scalable quantum systems, which is particularly suited to atoms, ions, and atom-like objects. And uh, what we are doing in this approach is we are basically starting with a large number of qubits and try to control them in parallel uh, to basically kind of make them interact with each other and kind of produce interesting quantum states and execute interesting quantum algorithms. So I hope I will convince you that uh, this uh, approach has a potential for uh, both probing and understanding quantum matter, but also realizing and testing uh, with quantum algorithms. But what's actually most important is that we can really do it already now with systems sizes, which can really not be simulated classically, at least not easily. So in particular, I'd like to focus in my talk uh, on the approach involving uh, called neutral atoms and um, uh, those systems have been known to the community for a while now. So uh, in particular, they have a number of key advantages. They have, for example, excellent coherence properties. For example, think about most advanced optical clocks. Uh, it is also fairly easy to create a large number of neutral atoms. And um, uh, that's another important feature. Also, uh, those systems have some disadvantages, which so far prevented them from being uh, sort of... Uh, uh, really kind of deployed appropriately in the field of quantum information and so one of them is that neutral atoms generally interact weakly as opposed to for example ions but also neutral atoms are very hard to control individually at least, at least in large numbers so motivated by these considerations uh, a couple of years ago uh, we started to kind of exp explore a new approach to building quantum systems and in this approach, what we uh, do is we basically use a kind of idea similar to the maxwell gimman where we actually remove the entropy by observation. So specifically, and what we do in our approach, we start with the gas uh, of pre-cooled atoms, pre-cooled by conventional techniques of laser cooling. And then we shine the focused uh, laser beams, the so-called optical tweezers, inside this uh, vacuum chamber. And we focus these tweezers so tightly such that each of them can at most have uh, one atom. But instead of starting with one tweezer, we start with many, typically about 100, 
uh, and uh, try to load them all at once. And then what happens is that because the system has entropy, some trap end up being loaded and some are empty. So in order to remove the entropy, what we do is we simply take a picture of these atoms and then basically figure out which traps are full and which are empty, remove the empty trap and then rearrange uh, the uh, few traps in any desired configuration. Uh, at this point, we end up with the regular array of atoms, uh, typically, you know, a couple of uh, micrometers uh, in separation. And what we do now, we need to engineer the interaction between them. In order to do that, what we do is we excite these atoms into the so-called Rydberg states, the states with large principal quantum numbers in which the atom size becomes very large and then atoms start feeling each other's presence, even at large distance. And by doing that, I will show you that we can really uh, execute, you know, uh, uh, quantum operations with very high fidelity. And this is a collaborative effort within uh, uh, Harvard, MIT, with a uh, group of Marcus Greiner and Vlad and Vujicic. So here is just one slide of the experimental setup. The key element in the setup is this device called Acousto Optic Deflector. It's kind of a similar device which is used for bar cams, bar ca cold scanners in supermarkets. So basically what it does it takes as an input one laser beam and a number of radio frequency tones and for each tone the beam is deflected and basically what we do is we focus this uh, in a vacuum chamber and then basically you know have another objective where we can take the picture and basically figure out which traps are full which are empty and then you know to just remove a trap we just remove the tone to move the trap we just sweep the frequency of the tone and that's uh, the experimental team how it is actually a little bit old picture Okay, so here is uh, some examples how we can prepare a regular way of 50 or so atoms. So we start with 100 traps, try to load them, there is a lot of entropy, and then we take a picture and rearrange it. And what you see after rearrangement, the uh, system is much more ordered. And uh, what we can do, of course, we can also you know, create some patterns, for example, clusters of two, clusters of 10, and these are all single short atom images. So for example, here is one atom missing, but it's the only one. Here is another one, but it's the only one. So it's actually, uh, results in a very high fidelity uh, preparation. And of course, we can also vary the geometry with each repetition. So up to now, the atoms uh, are completely classical. So uh, we now need to encode qubits uh, inside the atoms. And one approach to do it is to basically encode uh, qubits in a combination of the ground and the Rydberg state. And the reason why we like these Rydberg states is uh, twofold. So first of all, uh, the Rydberg states have generally quite long lifetime, uh, generally more than hundreds of microseconds. And also they have very strong interactions. When the atoms are both in the Rydberg states, they start uh, interacting <laughs> with each other simply because the atom size becomes very large. And in fact, this wonder wall interaction between the two atoms in the Rydberg state scales asymptotically as 11th power of a principal quantum number. And for n about uh, 100, it's actually 14 orders of magnitude stronger than the interaction between the ground state atoms. So 14 orders of magnitude is a large number and one can make good use of that. So in particular, uh, one uh, uh, type of entangling operation which we uh, very, like, uh, very much like to use involves the idea of the Rydberg blockade. So basically the idea is the following. So if you have two atoms and they're very far away and you just try to drive them resonantly, then they will undergo independent radio oscillations. But if you bring them uh, close to each other, uh, eventually these um, uh, interactions between the Rydberg atoms will take over and actually result in energy shift. And this energy shift becomes so large that at some point it's just impossible to excite both of the atoms simultaneously. So specifically, you know, if you bring the atoms close, what you see is doubly excited level, you know, will go up. So you'll be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. So that's the idea of the so-called Rydberg blockade, and it basically prohibits the excitation, uh, simultaneous excitation of atoms at a distance smaller than certain characteristic uh, radius, and this characteristic radius can be actually varied from just, you know, maybe about one micron to something like 50 microns, depending on uh, the state that you pick. So basically, at the end of the day, our uh, operation of our uh, processor or simulator will be as follows. So we'll start with the um, atoms uh, uh, in traps, which have a lot of entropy, a lot of disorder, prepare uh, regular arrays of a desired shape, and then start exciting them into Rydberg states with pulses, where we'll control the tuning phases and duration, and then eventually just measure the atoms which are uh, in the ground state. 
you know, that way we can identify which atom is in a ground state, which atom is in a liquid state. So this system, uh, uh, this approach have been actually proposed theoretically already almost two decades ago, but up until recently it was really not viewed as a kind of very promising approach. And the key um, issue was that it was actually very hard to achieve high fidelity uh, uh, manipulation of the Rydberg states. Actually changed about a year ago. And this is one example uh, where, you know, we just try to prepare a bell state of two uh, proximal atoms. So in this case, what you do, you just excite them simultaneously. And then basically because of blockade, you can only create one excitation. If the, if the phases of these lasers are well defined, then you will just create one superposition of these two states. You'll just go to this state. And actually you can very easily check it. For example, you can just check the number of uh, doubly excited atoms and what you see is that it's basically, you know, consistent with noise. So you just, you know, do your oscillations between ground state and one atom excited. You know, to prove entanglement, you actually have to basically measure the parity of this uh, excitation. The way to do it is just to basically apply the laser beam to one of the atoms, which will shift this energy levels a little bit and cause this kind of precession between uh, the uh, one bell state and another. And basically just then try to kind of stimulate the atom uh, back and that way you can really, you know, basically measure the parity and, you know, uh, uh, kind of fully characterize the state and actually the fidelity of the state which we measured about a year ago was about 97%. Okay, so with these tools I would like to now show you what we can do, uh, both kind of in the area of quantum simulations but also in the area of quantum information processing. And the first thing I'd like to do is kind of uh, go back uh, to the original idea of Feynman, which uh, also was kind of amplified, amplified upon yesterday by John. And you know, this is kind of the idea that simulating quantum dynamics is, is, is hard. So basically if you have n uh, strongly interacting qubits and you want to really you know, uh, look how they evolve dyna dynamically, this is kind of exponentially challenging problem. And, Basically, what we'd like to do now is to use our model system to implement uh, the system in the lab and try st studying that. And, you know, once again, this will be the idea. We prepare the atom array, you know, subject to some unitary evolution and just measure the final state. So the specific model which we will implement will be an Ising type model, but it will be slightly different. So this is actually a Hamiltonian of the uh, of our system, you know, involving one-dimensional Rydberg array. So here, this is a spin flip term. So this is a term proportional to laser detuning. This is like a chemical potential, or if you want magnetic field in the z direction, and this is the interaction term. So if you want, if you ask a question, for example, what's the ground state of this model? Uh, you can quantify it in terms of this detuning and in terms of this interaction range. So when the interaction range is very small and interactions are negligible, Clearly, depending on the sign of the detuning, you will either have all atoms in a ground state, you know, or all atoms in a Rydberg state, right? This is just what this chemical potential uh, determines. But if you now, for example, turn on the interaction and turn on, on blockade between nearest neighbors, clearly states like this will not be accessible. So basically, the uh, uh, the lowest energy state uh, you can access in this uh, situation is the state where every atom is excited because simply nearest neighbors are, are blockaded. Then if you extend the range of blockade, you can also block not just nearest neighbor, but second nearest neighbor. That way you break Z3 uh, symmetry, you know, and here you break Z4 symmetry. So you can basically have a full uh, kind of family of the state. So this one is the simplest, is basically a state with anti-ferromagnetic <coughs> order parameter. And so we can explore this phase diagram by, for example, starting with all atoms in the ground state and just trying to basically adiabatically enter all of these different phases. And actually, you know, it's very easy to do and, you know, you immediately see how this different kind of order uh, is emerging. So basically here, by just, you know, either picking different state or picking the separation between the atoms, you can really, you know, break the desired uh, uh, symmetry. Uh, but of course, the most interesting thing now is to really go to a large system size and to explore this kind of phenomena in systems uh, of, you know, uh, where n is large, for example, about 50. And uh, what uh, will, uh, kind of happens here is typically if we do this transition, you know, we very seldom, at least in the beginning, we very seldom would get a completely ordered state. So for example, this is a, a case of this uh, 
transition into anti-ferromagnetic state where you end up with uh, up down up down up down order but then here is uh, some you know imperfection some defects and then again there is a order chain and there is some uh, uh, defects so basically these defects are kind of domain walls so it's just a classic picture of the phase transition in one dimension and what you can do you can for example study now domain wall you can study the density of domain wall as you go across the phase transition you can study fluctuations and actually what we see here is that right at the point of phase transition the, the domain wall density fluctuates because just system can try, tries to choose you know which state it should actually stay one or another and actually that way you can for example pinpoint where the phase transition uh, um, occurs but what you also see is that basically kind of, uh, you know, in using these tools, you can really have, you know, quite detailed insights in the transition, in the phase transition. So in particular, in some cases, you do end up with a state which is fully ordered, and this was uh, some of our early results. So basically, the state actually m most probable from all microstates, but the probability of occurring that was very small. So we actually, you know, worked quite hard since we published this uh, uh, results, and the probability, you know, has been, steadily improving and I will show you basically at the end of my talk you know some of the recent results where we basically you know have you know can have you know transitions in those states where this state occurs with probability of, of uh, close to unity so uh, another way to characterize it you know this order is just look at density density correlation and you can extract the correlation length and so what you see is that basically you know, using all of these tools, we can really start to get in some kind of very interesting insights into this uh, uh, phase transition. So uh, I will just briefly talk about one kind of aspect of the work which we did, which really um, involves probing dynamics uh, across this phase transition. And actually you can probe these dynamics using two ways. You can go across the phase transition slowly and then and you end up probing the so-called Hibble-Zurich mechanism. And then you can also go across the phase transition rep, uh, uh, abruptly. And in this uh, area, we actually really made the first discovery. And this is a discovery of the so-called quantum many body scale. So this work is, by the way, is actually a collaboration with a quite number of theory groups, including Peter and, 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 and Subi. So let's first focus on this slow uh, transition. And here, what we will do is we'll study the so-called quantum critical dynamics. So basically, close to the phase transition, uh, uh, what happens is that, you know, the correlation length, the, you know, the other parameter should basically uh, kind of diverge. And at the same time, another property of the phase transition uh, is the energy gap, and typically the energy gap should close at the phase transition. And uh, for a second order uh, phase transition, the way how uh, correlation length diverges and how the gap closes is characterized by two uh, numbers, uh, they are so-called critical exponents, so one of them is called correlation length critical exponent, and then another one is dynamical critical exponent, so they are uh, usually associated with universal properties of the phase transition, so it doesn't really matter what your original model is, so so long as your transition is a certain universality class, mu and z will be defined. So if we now uh, try to go across a phase transition with a constant speed, however, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, just stay in a ground state. So in particular, what will happen is that, you know, basically if you start with the uh, uh, ground state, you know, and you're far away from the uh, critical point, if you go to constant speed, you will remain in a ground state, but then eventually, uh, you know, you will come to the point where the energy gap is very small, so you will start creating excitation. So this is related uh, to this uh, uh, so-called Hibble-Zurich mechanism, which basically predicts non-equilibrium effects, scaling of defects, by using this universal critical exponent. And the idea is the following. So basically, if you look at now growth of the correlation, so long as you are diabetic, you will just follow this curve and correlations will grow. But at the point when you start creating the excitations, clearly the growth process will stop. And uh, what uh, uh, Hibble Zurich uh, kind of postulate really is, is that this correlation length in the ordered phase should really stay the same as the freeze out uh, point. And from this kind of consideration, it's very easy to predict how the density of defects or correlation length will scale with uh, the, for example, speed with which you go across the phase transition. And it will actually scale as a power law with this characteristic uh, uh, coefficient mu, uh, the, the power law, uh, which is actually called sometimes Hibble-Zurich exponent. 
All right, so that's kind of the physics of Kibble Zurich um, uh, uh, mechanism, which actually is relevant not just for uh, quantum transitions, but also for a classical transition. In fact, it was initially discussed um, in the context of the early uh, universe, but actually about 15 years or so ago, there was a number of papers, theoretical papers, pointed out that this uh, uh, mechanism should be really applicable also to the uh, quantum phase transitions. And actually, uh, during that time, there was a number of experiments which tried to really demonstrate it, but it actually turned out to be quite difficult. And you know, one of the people who kind of tried to really do it is Wojciech Zurich himself, so I guess, uh, there is a uh, D wave uh, machine and accessible to Los Alamos, and Wojciech and his colleagues have really tried to kind of test this uh, uh, mechanism and actually it did not really work out, you know. Um, and uh, kind of maybe not surprisingly, uh, but um, uh, basically, in response to that, they wrote a paper kind of. Uh, uh, pointing out that this quantum kibble Zurich mechanism can be viewed as broadly applicable and easy to implement test of how quantum or adiabatic your specific hardware is. So for us, it's actually very easy to do this test. So what we do is just we start with, let's say, 50 atom array and then, you know, uh, try to uh, go across the phase transition with various speeds. So if we go fast, we have a lot of defects. If we go slow, we have few defects and we can just plot how this number of these defects grow and basically you know from here what we can do we can just you know plot uh, uh, the scaling and the scaling turns out to be in a very good agreement with actually a quantum phase transition in the Ising model and this one is very well known mu equals e is equals one mu should be equals one half and um, and basically starting from that we in fact already started to explore this uh, technique to uh, to, to, to use it to basically explore uh, new types of, uh, uh, you know, phase transitions, the, the exotic phase transitions which are not as well understood and that's actually, uh, you know, we have already reported some of these results in a paper which I cited. So, uh, 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 at the same time, uh, we also uh, try to do the non-adiabatic excitation and that's actually when we really saw some surprise. So basically, uh, in some of the very first experiments which we have done with the system, we created this kind of, you know, uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic order, up, down, uh, up, down. But then instead of stopping here, we would actually uh, uh, do the quench. We would change the tuning abruptly uh, to just go across the phase transition. And the idea, our idea is, was initially to study how the system thermalizes, and this is an example of five atom system where what you see is that, you know, after this quench, you know, something funny is going on. And actually, if you look at, if you zoom in at certain moments, what you see is that this initial order appears to be kind of inverted. And then, you know, you wait a little bit, the initial order disappears. And when we saw it, you know, we initially were very puzzled. We thought, hmm, maybe it's a small system size effect. But then we repeated it on larger and larger system. And we still saw this kind of oscillation in the order parameter, for example, the main wall density. So uh, why is it surprising? Why is it puzzling? So the reason why this is puzzling is that because uh, we are working at the point where our system is not integrable. And actually, you know, an integrable system should thermalize, generally should thermalize fast. Uh, and, you know, you could say, well, you have this blockade, it's a constraint, but they actually even under this constraint, the system can explore quite large Hilbert space given by this golden ratio to the power of n. And uh, under such, uh, you know, conditions, you would expect rapid uh, thermalization, but it does not occur. So uh, already kind of, you know, after our first observations, we started doing some simulations on smaller systems, on systems up to 20 uh, or so atoms. And what we saw is that actually this kind of, these oscillations are accompanied by kind of very non-trivial growth of entanglement entropy. So this growth was non-monotonic and moreover kind of coarse grain was actually very, very slow. So uh, this was at the time when we published our paper, we kind of our, we had some insights. We saw that if, uh, what is, these oscillations are occur only for certain initial state, actually other initial states thermalize rapidly. But these uh, um, uh, oscillations are connected to slow growth of entanglement, probably due to this constrained dynamics due to the blockade. So, uh, uh, you know, 
after we published our paper, uh, actually there was a lot of theoretical kind of interest in that. And actually there are several ideas which were put forward. Some of them I uh, 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 kind of like uh, very much. So this is, for example, one of these ideas connecting it to uh, observation to something which is called quantum many body scar. So what uh, quantum scars is a concept from quantum chaos. So basically if you have a classically chaotic system like a billiard, um, um, it might have a small number of closed unstable trajectories. And you would say if you quantize the system, this trajectory should not play a role. Actually, it turns out that it's not always the case. Under certain conditions, you end up with basically kind of eigenstates which resemble this kind of classical meta unstable periodic order. And uh, what uh, this group of uh, Dima Banyan and Mark Serbian, you know, pointed out is that they pointed out that our kind of uh, refinement of oscillation uh, kind of may, may be viewed as a kind of many body version of these cars. So I must say, initially I was actually very skeptical about that, but you know, we started thinking some more about that. And actually there is some very nice connection that you can make um, uh, between the many body problem to the single uh, particle problem. And this connection is provided by uh, tensor network states. So specifically, it turns out you can come up with the matrix product state with <coughs> one dimension equals two, uh, uh, which you, if you parameterize with certain parameters, you know, you end up precisely with these unstable trajectories, which corresponds to this kind of collapses and revivals, correspond to these oscillations. But it turns out it's only the beginning of the story. So uh, our colleague, uh, string theorist Daniel Jefferis, was actually very excited about this. Said, oh, this is some things like this. I was really looking for, uh, you know, examples which he thinks really may be connected to the basically kind of Kepler orbits of particles ar around black hole in a kind of uh, quantum gravity. But uh, there are also some very nice connections pointed out to dynamics is like these gauge theories. And actually, well, by now there is almost like a paper every every week, you know, you know, providing um, uh, an, uh, another explanation. And actually, I think that really points out that this area of quantum dynamics is really the area where this quantum machine, near quantum ma term quantum machine, can really, you know, make an impact. Right? Because these are this area where no one has ever gone to. These are very complex systems which are very hard to simulate. And I think this is very exciting. So let me kind of now uh, switch gears and. Also connect to the point that, for example, yesterday uh, John uh, was pointing out that, you know, um, like the analog systems are very kind of much prone to the errors and, uh, um, you know, it's kind of very hard to uh, think about to scale this up. So, so far, I basically, my, in my entire talk, I talked about analog systems. And the question is how good they are. So let's find some kind of test which will be kind of system agnostic you know, which will not depend on whether we do gates or we do analog simulations. And one of them is uh, uh, creation of large scale entanglement. So for example, we can pick, you know, some uh, interesting entangled state like a head state or GG state, um, uh, uh, which is uh, kind of paradigmatic example of entanglement. So this is, you know, the state is known as extremely fragile. It's basically maximally sensitive to coherence. It's also useful for certain tasks. But actually what's also special is that this uh, state is very easy to characterize. So basically if you have a, a density matrix, all you need to know, you need to know basically, you know, two diagonal elements and two off diagonal elements. And then from there you can construct the fidelity of the state and basically fidelity is larger than 0.5 is sufficient for n partitioned entanglement. So let's see if we can create this entanglement in our experiment. So what we'll do here, we'll work with even atom arrays. Um, uh, systems of the kind shown here. And then what we'll do initially, we'll try to do this kind of adiabatic transitions, basically go into anti-ferromagnetic state. So you will, in this case, end up with the combination of state up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up, down, up. Uh, um, unfortunately, what happens is that there are other states also allowed. For example, the state like this, where you have two Lindbergh atoms on edges, it also fulfills the block case. So we will need to somehow remove these states if we want to create a real kind of uh, GAG state, you know, and it's actually very easy to do what we can do. We can just, you know, uh, apply um, uh, effective magnetic field, you know, on edges by shining the laser beams and just, you know, kick the state, uh, you know, out basically put it at a higher energy. So in this case, so what you can do, you can try to do just adiabatic transition. You can start with all atoms in the ground state and then uh, 
uh, try to uh, just adiabatically enter, uh, go across a phase transition. And in this case, you end up uh, indeed with populations uh, pre uh, preferentially in this up, uh, down, up, down, and down, up, down, ups. Of course, this is not enough to really prove the entanglement. In order to prove the entanglement, you need to basically measure all diagonal elements. The way how you can do it is basically apply effective staggered magnetic field, apply the uh, la you know, shiny laser build on, uh, on any, every other atom. And in this case, what happens is that this state would pick up the phase and then basically what you need to just rotate the basis and we do it by using this quench, by using this quantum scar and uh, effect and measure parity. And this is the parity oscillations from these two. You can really very easily extract fidelity. So in this case, we see that we create an entangled state. But of course, what we are really interested, we are in interested in scaling this, this up. And uh, here is, uh, for example, the system with eight uh, particles. And then already now you see that this kind of uh, the levels here become like a mess. So in principle, if you say, if you are diabetic, you might be able to end up in this state, but it will become, you know, kind of very, very challenging. So we address this challenge uh, by using the ideas from optimal control. So specifically, we collaborated with the group of Tamasa and Simona, and we used their, uh, the so-called red crab protocol, which we impl they implement on this kind of uh, remote service to basically find uh, uh, some optimal control uh, pulses. And actually, quite remarkably, this kind of uh, technique allows us to find non adiabatic trajectories, which can really allow for some potential speed up. So here is uh, just one example of this uh, 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 pulse and, you know, basically, and, and, and the levels and, and also probabilities to occupy the levels. So what you see mostly throughout this protocol, you stay in the ground state, but close to close to the point where the, the, uh, the kind of the, 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 the most slowdown is expected, the system leaves the ground state ma manifold and occupies the first maybe two or so states and then basically, you know, just you go through this state and, you know, it's a kind of like two or three level system dynamics in such a way to really kind of go across this crossing quite fast. So basically, so we really some see some speed up um, and uh, the physics of that is connected to this kind of so-called shortcuts which people study in, uh, for example, quantum optimization problem. But what's actually most important is that we end up with the sequence which is basically equivalent of to the circuit with the depth which scale with the system size. So which means for n equals 20, it's and p is in all about 400 within about the same time that it would take to execute the gate, right, within about a microsecond. And so here is the result for 20 atoms. So what you see, there are many possible states, but two clearly stand out. And these are this uh, up, down, and down, up state. And uh, if you look at correlation function, so you see something like that. So that's actually experimental result. These correlations are basically persist across the entire array. Uh, but if you now uh, apply this uh, staggered magnetic field and you know, change the system size, what you see is that the kind of increases as uh, uh, as it should, and from here you can basically, you know, plot the JG fidelity as a function of the system size, and uh, what you, uh, 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 you know, what we see is that we can basically create the uh, JG states up to a system size of about 20 atoms. So maybe two quick comments, you know, one uh, is this gray area, it's actually the area which is in inaccessible to us, and the reason is that because uh, when we measure parity, we don't just do a simple rotation. We use this basically scar, quantum scar type quenches, and basically they are good but not perfect. So we cannot have fidelity higher than that. Uh, but even with that, this uh, is actually a largest JG which is, has ever been generated. So actually, contemporary with our work, there were two superconducting papers uh, which made 18 atom, 18 qubit JG state, but you know, so. Uh, uh, but it really shows, you know, the power of the system and the power of this approach. And moreover, in Boston, we are not done yet. So, uh, so we have a lot of kind of tricks which we can actually apply, you know. So, and uh, uh, I think it's really quite exciting. We would like to understand dynamics, robustness, distribution of entanglement. Just one, you know, simple example of what we already have done. So I've shown you how we can create this kind of GG state by uh, uh, creating light shifts on a penalizing the, the edge uh, states and creating the states. Uh, so what we can do uh, in this case, rather than stopping, 
we can actually try to um, uh, localize the atom excitation at the edges by shining light of different detuning, and then you know reverse the sweep and try to basically disentangle the bus. And you know, in this case, what you uh, end up with, you should end up with the bell state, you know, on the edges or actually any other two points of the of the shuttle. And actually, this is a protocol which we implemented, and it actually works. And potentially, this technique can be used for fast entanglement distribution. All right. So I think uh, I have maybe five minutes or so. Yes. Five minutes, then, then there will be less five minutes for the okay, entire. So, all right, so let me take three minutes, okay? So, uh, and um, uh, so I think we have a lot of ideas, and actually, I would just like to kind of indicate a couple of uh, directions where this work uh, is going, so in particular, uh, involving these two uh, directions. So, one thing which actually I would like to kind of point out, I'd like to go back to this analog versus digital, so I haven't really talked about quantum operations. and. Part of the reason is that, you know, the kind of uh, basis, qubit basis, which I use so far involving ground and Rydberg states is kind of peculiar. So um, on one hand, this uh, Rydberg state, they live for a long time, but not, you know, extraordinarily long, um, but uh, which would limit the number of operations, but also, you know, basically, if particularly if you use blockade, you know, we cannot really sort of do universal ga gate state uh, uh, sets with them. So basically, to do the universal gates, what we need to do, we need to encode our qubit in the hyperfine uh, uh, states, for example, two spin states of the uh, ground state manifold, and we can then operate these qubits with, for example, Raman lasers, and then if we need to turn on the interactions, we can just excite one of them into the Rydberg state. Then actually combining this with this, for example, uh, local light shifts of the kind uh, uh, that I already indicated uh, we can do, uh, now allows us to really kind of, you know, implement the gates and test these gates. And so here is uh, some examples. Actually, this is literally a work in progress, the data taken within the last week or so. Uh, so, um, uh, so here we try to basically implement the C0 uh, gate and actually, uh, you know, the previous attempts to do this on the Rydberg system were limited to something like 8%. So we actually now, you know, I have quite reasonable fidelity, and as I said, we are not done yet, it's a work in progress, but actually perhaps what's more exciting in this system and our system, it's very natural to apply multi-qubit gates at once. And this is an example of a toppling gate uh, with the pro uh, which where we extract process fidelity larger than 93%. So I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I know, that's the highest fidelity of a toppling gate which has been uh, observed. And uh, I think we are only starting here. I think there's a lot of, you know, kind of potential for really doing truly, you know, highly parallel multi-qubit operations that, you know, for various quantum algorithms, it will be very, very exciting. So that's a so-called natural gate set. Uh, another natural thing which we can do is actually connect our system to, um, uh, to quantum optimization. And one uh, famous optimization problem which maps into our system almost without any overhead is uh, the so-called maximum independent set. So the problem is very simple. So if you have basically um, uh, a system of vortices and connect these vortices with links, so you'd like to color as many vortices as possible, but you cannot color the connected vortices. And so for example, this is one independent set, this is another. So for this problem, it's a maximum independent set. Uh, and, uh, you know, here is another example of this independent set problem, which actually, you know, you might, you know, have some connection to. So, for example, if you look at the cover of your airline magazine, you often see pictures like this. This is a maximum independent on a unit disk graph, where vertices are connected only within a given uh, uh, distance. So this uh, uh, is a particular instance of the problem. It's still a NP complete. To find the exact solution of this problem is NP complete. So if you followed my talk, however, uh, you will uh, uh, be able to immediately see that this is nothing but the uh, solution to the ground state of a Rydberg blockade, Hamiltonian, where this disk uh, uh, size is nothing but the uh, Rydberg blockade. And we are now uh, starting to uh, think about what algorithms we can actually efficiently implement. Uh, in particular, we are thinking, of course, about things like QEOA. So in order to do that experimentally, we should uh, do one step. We should actually go from one dimension to two. So, so far we worked with just one acoustic optic deflector. 
if we have two of them, then we can easily, you know, create these kind of patterns and also move atoms like this. And so what we are doing right now in the lab, we actually create two-dimensional arrangements of atoms, you know, in various kind of configurations and start loading this kind of trap. So basically, we kind of aim to work with systems of maybe 100 to 1,000 uh, uh, qubits. And I think this is really a very exciting frontier, which where we can both study many body dynamics, but also start, you know, uh, testing this quantum optimization work. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and perhaps there is some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions? So uh, how extensible do you think the uh, this mechanism is for multiply control NOT gates? Uh, and do you think there's some sort of fundamental limit in terms of how many control qubits you could have with a single target? So, okay, so maybe let me do, let me answer in two ways. So first of all, one thing that you actually did not, you know, mention is when we do, when we did this gate operation, uh, we immediately give them, give uh, uh, this data which I showed were done on multiple pairs at once. So for example, for C0, we did that for like five pairs in parallel for the, for, uh, for the top gate, it was four kind of triplets. So, uh, but you know, if you ask the question about what would be like how many qubits you can control uh, in one kind of shot, um, in two dimension the number can actually be quite sizable. It can be kind of an order of hundred or so. And uh, the way how you achieve it is basically by just you know uh, picking the right kind of Rydberg state, you know, and making sure that Rydberg blockade is large. So you know, I think you know, actually maybe even a few hundred could be. You know, in what, uh, could be done in principle. So just make sure that I understand what you're saying correctly. One, so yeah, one qubit. You know, you can basically implement like Toffoli gate. You know, with potentially like two hundred. So, so that is to say, you could have a a hundred controlled, singly targeted mm -hmm. gate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you were mentioning about creating JZ state, uh -huh. and given that you're, you can do also create 2D array, is it natural to consider you can create 2D graph state, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we certainly, that's what we kind of, yeah. yeah. So JZ state was the simplest example, but you know, one can certainly generalize it to have cluster states, graph states. So if you have some interesting ideas, this is something that we are, you know, actively looking for. In particular, 2D, I think this would be very interesting. Is it also possible to implement tripartite interactions such as for hypergraph state like CCZ gate? So the uh, interactions, uh, maybe I don't know if I understand your question correctly, but so the interactions in our case, of course, pairwise. But uh, what you can do, for example, what you can do, you just, you can use kind of multiple, you know, like in, I think in two steps, you can effectively implement a tri tripartite interaction, if I understand you correctly. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Actually, I had a question. So uh, when you had this chain, when you want to do like all of all, uh, the, the, the Z2 one, mm -hmm. it's, it happens when it's on a range. Mm -hmm. So now when you do it in a finite system, you have these edges mm -hmm. that you had to move on. Mm -hmm. But then you create a new edge by removing those two edges. So mm -hmm. is it like a scalable way to? No, so, so this is like this edge effects, you know, um, are important in terms of kind of odd even effects. So if you have, uh, so initially, like well, our first experiments were, were done with 51 atoms. And the reason why we wanted to have more than 50, but we wanted to really have an odd number of atoms. So in this case, this edge effects really kind of play significant role. So it actually pins this creature. So for all that number of atoms, it does not, there is no pinning. Uh, but you know what you can do with this kind of uh, light shift is really like you know you can think about it as kind of engineering of the spectrum of the many body spectrum, right? And basically, you know, in this case, you know, you create really you know situation where this you know like two states you know with sort of you know up down up down up, down up are really precisely degenerate, and there are only two two of them. 
does it answer so your question? In the, uh, because the translation of symmetry is broken. That's right, but it doesn't here. It's a finite system, so it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't as long as it's yeah. finite, then there yeah. might be some gap that you can break. But it, it's it's not scalable. If like if it's like hundred, there will be still edges in the system. No, this not no. It's nothing. So basically, if you go to higher uh, atom number, what happens is just the gap closes. You know, yeah. and uh, but I mean, it, it's it's fundamental. You know, even yeah. if you have, even if you're on a ring, it's the same. There's no this is yeah. this like mm -hmm. that's you know it's that's sca it's as scalable as it can get. You know, yeah. it can be more scalable than that. <laughs> it's fundamental. Like that. So. Any other question? So let's thank. Oh, uh, there is one. So you, thank you very much for your fruitful talk. Uh, so you went from the trivial phase into Z2 or Z, Zn phases mm -hmm. in your experiment. Mm -hmm. And can you say anything about the tran phase transition between Zn phases? So from Z2 to Z3 phases. Or yeah, Z3 so it's actually phase. very, so this other, yeah, so I didn't have time to talk about it, but we actually explored, we, we explored the, um, we did not study transitions between, let's say, Z2 and Z3. But we studied very carefully transitions, for example, from the disordered phase to G3 and G4. And you know, there, you know, it's like one of these things where something to begin is very simple, but it gets very complicated very quickly. So, so in particular, the transition in the G3 uh, phase uh, has been apparently kind of a subject of major controversy for the last 30 years. And uh, this transition is related to something which is uh, sometimes called chiral clock model. Uh, that's kind of a model which, you know, have been studied both in condensed matter and some high energy uh, physics. And basically, uh, the trend and the question was whether this is a direct transition or whether this is uh, there is some kind of incommensurate phase. So actually, our experiments are very much consistent that with the fact that it's a direct transition and is actually we measured the critical exponent connected to this chiral clock model. So, but we also went to the Z4 phase where generally it's believed that this should not be a transition, that there should be some incommensurate phase, kind of like a uh, sort of a glassy phase, but not you know quite in between. Uh, actually, we all, our experiment also suggests that it looks like it's a direct transition, <coughs> but you know, there we do not have a theory yet to really compare. Okay, let's thank Misha again and uh